Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. That's better. It makes me feel good. I'm happy to be invited back here one more time. I've been to three of the four Autodesk universities, and uh, I'm very excited to be here for one more. And today, of course, I'm going to be talking to you about the future of making things. And just so you guys know, this slide's not advancing on my screen. It would be good if what I saw on my screen, oh, there we go, perfect. And at Autodesk, we are very focused on this theme for about the last year and a half, the future of making things. And I'm hoping that in this presentation today that you will see and hear about some great customer stories and some amazing technology that will really open up your mind and maybe get you thinking about some of the opportunities for you in your design career. And as you sit through the classes today and you learn more about this technology, and I'm sure you'll hear some more customer stories today, that it will just kind of open you up and you can start to think about your future in making things. And if you want to come and get a seat, we have plenty of seats up here in the front. No need to stand up if you don't want to. So along with this whole notion of the future of making things, we at Autodesk have been talking a lot about disruption. Now, when you hear disruption, the word disruption, we usually think that's a really bad thing. Nobody says, yay, disruption. But in reality, if you take a look at history, it's actually been disruption that has helped us move forward. And often it opens up many doors and opportunities for us to you know, maybe change our course, but to be successful in a different direction. And then I thought I'd look up a, a a nice definition of disruptive innovations. And I know you guys can read. But it's innovation that helps create a new market and value network, which is a good thing. And it eventually disrupts an existing market and value network over a few years or decades, displacing an early technology. And I'm, I'm quite sure that there are many of you that have already been through a pretty disruptive technology in the world of design. So some of you might remember the good old days when we used to draft by hand on paper. And then this whole CAD thing came along. And we were kind of forced to go from drawing by hand to trying to draw on a computer. And in my very early, I was involved in the very early days of AutoCAD. And I was a teacher of AutoCAD. And I had so many students that would say, this is ridiculous. I could have drawn this by hand by now. This CAD's never going to catch on. And I actually had people who got up out of my class and left my class <laughs> in a huff and never returned. So at that point in time, not only did they have to learn a software program for CAD, but let's face it, most of them had never worked on a computer before as well. So it was a very difficult thing, extremely disruptive. But as we all, as we all know, eventually DWG became the standard worldwide. That CAD thing did catch on, and many of us, of course, adopted CAD over the years. And not too many people are left to join by hand. And then we also see this moving forward. In the last few years here at Autodesk University, we've talked a lot about BIM, and we've talked about digital prototyping and making that move from just plain old lines, arcs, and circles to something bigger. And I'm sure many of you have adopted BIM, but we might have seen that as a very disruptive technology as well. And I still have plenty of people who come up to me because they know me from AutoCAD. And they're like, oh my gosh, my, my company's making us move to BIM and I just want to stay on AutoCAD. Very disruptive, right? And I assure them that if they move forward and embrace it, they're actually going to be a lot happier in the long run. And many of you have heard me say that over the years here at Autodesk University. So we're going to talk about all different types of disruptions. We're going to see some pretty amazing disruptions and how our customers took advantage of the innovations that came from those disruptions. But we're going to look at the nature of disruption, how that disruption led to innovation, and how disruption leads to a better world. All right? So now, if you went to architectural school, there's a good chance that you may have studied the Crystal Palace, and you may have have studied the very famous architect, Joseph Paxton. 
And the Crystal Palace was built back in 1851. It was very disruptive. No one had ever seen a building like this before. It was comprised of very cheap, but very strong glass and cast iron. I like to say that the building was actually pretty green because it didn't require any internal lighting at all. They actually took a look at the sun and figured out how to put the glass in just the right places so that they didn't have to worry about lighting the building. And it was a huge, huge, huge building. It was, I'm going to look this one up, 550 meters long by 40 meters high. So it was a big building. It was very disruptive. Not everybody loved it. A lot of people didn't like it. But he was definitely on to something new. And then if you were to fast forward, in Singapore, there's a very famous mall that was built recently, the Orchard Mall. Kind of the same concept, mostly glass, but being able to take advantage of the technology that we have today. Lots of parametric technology. Um, so many different pieces of glass bent in so many different ways, different colors, different shapes, um, all able to be put together because of computers, basically. They weren't done, uh, wasn't constructed and designed all just by the humans. It was the computers jumped in there as well. Pretty amazing structure. I would say this is also a fairly disruptive structure. The people in Singapore either love it or they hate it. And just so you know, there's 56 floors, 52 escalators, four super escalators that go up four floors at a time, and 12 glass elevators. It's a pretty amazing structure. I have not seen it, but I would love to see that. So we're going to start off with the nature of disruption, and we're going to be covering three different areas. And I'll be talking, most of my examples are, are focused on the AEC industry, but we have quite a few manufacturing examples as well for those of you who are in manufacturing. So we're going to be talking about production, demand, and products. And let's start off by talking about production. So back when the Crystal Palace was built in 1851, they didn't have quite the same things to worry about as we do now. They probably had some other things to worry about that we don't worry about now. But as it stands right now, things have changed a bit. We're very, very focused on natural disasters, for example. And we need to take those into consideration in our designs, whether you're building a road or a bridge or a building. Uh, I was just in Santiago not too long ago. I worked with an architectural office whose claim to fame is that none of the buildings they've ever built has ever been ever fallen over because of an earthquake. And if you're familiar with Santiago, they have earthquakes all the time. They had a pretty big earthquake back in September, and a million people were evacuated from the city. But once again, their claim to fame, even though a couple buildings fell over, none of them were theirs. So they're experts at earthquakes and how to design buildings so they can withstand any earthquake. And we also, of course, are very focused on sustainability now. We want to harness the sun. We want to be, uh, we want to be energy efficient. We want to be sensitive to the future. And so these are things that even 20 years ago, we didn't really take into consideration like we do now. And then, of course, if you're, depending on what, what com countries your firm is working with and what areas of those countries, you might be in a situation where you also have to worry about security. We have buildings now that are being built with areas of refuge on every floor or with staircases specifically for firefighters, just in case there should be any security issues and something should go wrong. So we have very different things to worry about now than we did before. But the good part, oops, let me go back, I went too far. But the good part of that is we also have some amazing technology to go with it. So if you take a look at, in the upper left-hand corner there, that's the British Court Museum. And it is the largest covered public space in Europe. It has a two-acre space. And they just recently had a competition on who, who and how they were going to design that enclosure there, that glass ceiling that you see on there. So it turned out that the winner was actually a computer. The computer designed it, and the computer built it and put it in place. And no two of those panels are exactly the same. There's over 3,300 panes of glass. They're shaped differently. They're angled a little bit differently. But it was all constructed by a computer. Pretty interesting, using parametric technology. Other great technology, we have the ability to do simulations and do energy analysis and be able to do sun studies. Look in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, you can see that we have the ability to do these really interesting algorithms and come up with shapes that we've never even thought about before. I've seen this in buildings. I've seen it in furniture. I've, if you take a look at the design gallery, you're going to see some pretty interesting shapes in that 3D printed dress. And uh, we just have a lot of technology available to us to help us get our jobs done. And then in the lower left-hand corner, I actually want to talk about this a little bit more, as I love this story. So it turns out, in the United States, 
100,000 people die every year as a result of infections they get on the operating table in hospitals. That's pretty awful. And I now have probably just convinced all of you never to go to an American hospital, didn't I? Was not my goal. That's pretty awful. So a company called Hunt Air, who works with HVAC and the, is, works closely with hospitals to manage the airflow, they thought to themselves, maybe they could design a better operating room where we could, using fluid dynamics, figure out exactly how to get that airflow to go away from the operating table, which sounds pretty basic, but you know, it hasn't really been done up until now. And they investigated clean rooms to see how they did it in clean rooms. And they took the results and they did a lot of simulation using Autodesk products, and they figured out how to build a better operating room. And if we could even divide that number by half, that would be pretty good. So, amazing technology out there. In that case, we're talking about simulation. And then we also have some other interesting things that we throw into the mix. We're going to be talking about 3D printing. You hear a lot about 3D printing and a whole lot about prefabrication. So we have a lot going on in the industry right now to help us get our jobs done. So what you see in front of you is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And they decided that they wanted to expand it and they wanted it to look like the original building. So it kind of looks like on the right hand side there that it's breathing now, right? It's kind of breathing out, that big bulge on the side. And it, they were actually able to get quite a bit more room and space as a result of that bulge. But they wanted it to look like the original design. And they did this by 3D printing 700 panels off site. And they were designed to look like stand, sandstone, but they're actually fiber reinforced plastic. They're extremely lightweight. They were very easy to put on the building and put together to form this beautiful masterpiece. And, you know, this is an example where 3D printing was used in architecture. Another thing that we have available to us to help get our, our jobs done is the cloud. I think a couple of years ago when I was here, I did a whole session on the cloud. I love talking about the cloud because there's so many opportunities and things that we can do as a result of the cloud that we just couldn't do before. Simulation, for example. We would never do simulation on the computers that we have sitting at it in front of our, us on our desks. Very rarely. That would, your computer would fry <laughs> if you did too much simulation. As a result of the cloud, though, I can take all the information I need to do energy analysis or a simulation or renderings, and I can put that up in the cloud, access those 60 million servers worldwide, those supercomputers that have way more power than the laptops or the workstations that we have that we're using, and we can do things that we actually could never do before. I could go on and on about the cloud, but we'll talk a little bit about some technology that we only have available to us today because of our ability to harness the cloud. Let's talk a little bit about generative design. So we've been talking about generative design for about a year or so at Autodesk. Letting kind of the computer help you decide what the ultimate design would be. Now let's be clear, the computer's not taking your job away. It's just making, giving you some alternative ideas that maybe you would never think of before. And the way it works, instead of telling the computer what to do, you tell the computer what the goal is. Then you give them some parameters and some basic rules to follow and let the computer come up with some ideas. And I'm going to give you an example where that was just recently done, and we'll hear a little bit more about this, I think, throughout the day. This is a partition for the Airbus for the A320 planes. And at Autodesk University a couple of weeks ago, we had quite a display. We had a, a flight attendant that was attached to this particular partition. <laughs> it was brought up on the stage. And we talked about how we worked with Airbus to help them come up with a better design. And we actually did this also through generative design. Now, there's nothing wrong with this partition. I'm sure you've all seen them if you've been on a plane. Um, it's, it's, it's strong, it's lightweight, the flight attendants sit on it. It's not like there was a big issue with the partitions, but what if we could come up with one that was stronger and lighter? Nothing wrong with that. The original one had kind of a honeycomb shape to reinforce it, very clever design, but let's see if we can get the computer to come up with a better design. So we gave some rules to the computer, and Autodesk was very involved in this. And we also took a look at synthetic biology. Please, by all means, when you go to the design gallery, check this out. So we studied living systems, specifically bacteria, if you can imagine that. 
to generate some new ideas and some new designs. And the result of that, believe it or not, the panel now weighs half as much as it did before, and yet strangely it's even stronger than it was before. And as a result of that, each one of these panels will save 25 kilos in weight, and that translates to about $40,000 US in fuel savings for the life of the aircraft, and that's kind of a big deal. And as a result of that, Autodesk is now working with Airbus to redesign more of the cabin, maybe all of the cabin. We can maybe make it super lightweight and yet stronger, and there's an infinite number of possibilities of how, of how our planes might look in the future. Once again, take a look at the design gallery. It's some pretty clever ideas. So that's the power of generative design, and once again, that power would not be, would not be available if we didn't have the cloud. So let's take a look at demand. So demand is changing as well. For those of you in the building industry, I'm sure you're noticing that. Clients want more than they ever did before. The people that are going to be in the building want more than they ever wanted before. Everybody's all about being connected. I was just saying last night that, oh, I don't like this hotel because there's no place to plug in my cell phone right next to the bed. I actually have to get up and walk all the way across the room to plug in my phone. Can you imagine that? These are little things that we're starting to expect more and more of. I want a USB port right next to the bed. That's what I want. I want it to be really simple to be connected and to charge and all those good things. Our expectation level for all kinds of things is going up. No matter what industry you're in, you will find that your clients are going to be requesting more and more of you. And also the same is true with infrastructure. As cities become more connected and there's more data, you're going to see that there's going to be higher expectations there as well. I think we're just starting to see that, actually. Then last but not least, the last disruption that we're going to keep in mind is the nature of their product themselves. So let's look at a few, and I want you to notice there's this whole theme about being connected in here. I think we're going to see that being more of a theme. So on, on the left-hand side, I'm sure many of you have been to the Abu Dhabi airport. I myself have not been to the Abu Dhabi airport. Um, but their claim to fame, it's a very connected airport. They have sensors everywhere. And that they have the ability to do things like check out the flow of the people. There are too many people at the security section. We can either put more people there to help them out or move some of the passengers over to another security area. They know where the traffic is for the gift shops. They know exactly where anybody is at any given time in an effort to control the flow of the airport and, in their, and to have the best airport in the world. I th think that was some of, the, some of their goals in the early concepts. So very, very connected airport. You can come up later if I'm wrong and tell me you don't agree with the way the Abu Dhabi airport is being run. And then on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, some of you might be familiar with Nest. Um, I'm trying to buy a house right now, and as, as soon as if it happens, um, I'm actually going to put Nest up in my house. So this is a very intelligent thermostat heating air conditioning system so that it actually pays attention to your behavior and it adapts accordingly. And so you don't have to go in and say at 8 o'clock I want it to be warmer and uh, at 6 o'clock I want it to be cooler. You don't have to do any of that. It will start to realize your habits. You just manually go do it whenever you're too cold, too hot, and it'll eventually pick up your habits and take it over, take over for you. Or maybe you decide you want to leave work early and when you get home you want the, the house colder. You can log on to your app on your phone and you can change it right then and there so that when you get home your, your house is all nice and air conditioned. So it's a pretty smart, intelligent system. Um, I know for myself, I travel a lot and I cannot tell you how many times I've forgotten to turn, in my case, the heater off. I don't have an air conditioner. The heater off. And so I'm on vacation and I get to see all those dollars going do 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 do. Maybe if I'm lucky I can find someone to go over and, and turn the heater off. But how nice to be able to do that via an app. And then I was just reading about this. I found this very fascinating. This is Flare. It kind of takes it one step further. This was actually designed on one of our cloud applications, Fusion 360. Fabulous application. If any of you are manufacturing, take a look at it. Uh, you can use so much of it without having to pay anything right off the bat. Definitely take a look at it. It's pretty, pretty impressive. So Flare takes this whole concept with Nest, and it actually works with Nest to the next level. I don't know about you, but I, I live in a house where one part of the house stays warm and the other part of the house not so much. For, you know, the way that the heating systems work or the cooling systems work, it doesn't get to all of the rooms. So Flare is pretty smart. It starts to realize 
exactly where the heat is, where the heat isn't, or where the air conditioning is, where the air conditioning isn't, and it knows where you are. So it will make sure that whatever room you are in is at the temperature that you like. How does it know where you are? From your phone. So it talks to your phone, and it makes sure wherever you're at, you're in a comfortable room, and it puts the temperature up or down accordingly. So that's kind of cool, too. I like that. Just thoughts moving forward, very clever, creative ideas. You can do it. Thank you. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. So we were just kind of talking a little bit about the Internet of Things, a little bit. <coughs> to me, in my mind, the true definition of the Internet of Things are things talking to other things, not talking to us. But I think we do get that, that definition mixed up. And of course, we've all heard about smart kitchens, where I can scan barcodes when I put things into the refrigerator, and, and my refrigerator will tell me when I need to buy new milk or new eggs. Or perhaps you have a smart stove. If you leave and you can't remember if you turn the burner off, you can just log on to an app and check that out and make sure that you did. Or maybe you have something that you want to be cooking, and you want it to go on at a certain time during the day. Lots of possibilities that, for you there. And I really, to be honest, do not know what the sink would say to anybody. I'm not really sure about that one up there. But I'm sure the sink has something to say about something. Forgot to turn the dishwasher on before you left? I've done that. I can see that. So we talked about earlier documentation phase. And I would say that's kind of the making the move to CAD phase. And then we moved to the optimization phase, which I would say is making the move to BIM and digital prototyping, taking all of our designs to the next level, making smart buildings, making smart parts, smart machinery. And now I think we're going to see more of this whole connection aspect. Connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. We're going to hear more and more about that wherever we go. So let's take a look at some clever customers that have really harnessed innovation, some very disruptive technology, I would say, see what they've been able to do. So I love this, actually. I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is a very creative company that decided to build a hotel in China. They built this hotel in 15 days. It's 30 stories tall, 70K square feet, and it's able to withstand a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. You'll see here they do a little bit of testing, obviously a great deal of prefabrication done here, right? It's five times more energy efficient. And incidentally, the construction tolerance was less than 0.2 millimeters, if you can imagine that. Take a look at the airflow. If you've been to China, you know the air is not always so great. So they actually have a ventilation system to clean that air when it comes in. It's a pretty interesting hotel. And this company, incidentally, has a new goal to design the highest building in the world. You guys are going to have con competition out here with Burj Khalifa. I don't, I'll believe it when, they, when I see it. But that, the goal of that, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at this right here to make sure I get all my facts right. They're, they want to build the world's tallest building in about 90 days, standing at 9,749 feet, 838 meters. Is that higher than yours? And over 200 floors. This is an example also of, I think, very clever technology. If you've ever been to Mexico City, you know, one of the issues there is traffic. Traffic, 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 traffic. Very hard to get from one point to another. And they wanted to build an elevated highway so that they could divert some of that traffic and make traffic a little bit easier on a particular street. But they also knew that they could not stop the traffic to you just stop it dead to build this elevated highway. So they decided to do prefabrication to the nth degree. They actually measured all of the rebar. They bent all the rebar. They got all the right shapes of the rebar. They documented all the rebar. They tagged all the rebar. They constructed as much as possible ahead of time for this particular project, with the ultimate goal to only go out at night in as few days as possible, and just go out there and put the columns out there, and then put it all together one piece at a time. A serious amount of planning ahead. You'll actually see that they simulate the environment for when they get there, and they're going to put the columns up and put the highway together using BIM 360 glue there for the simulation. 
it's always good to make sure that the cranes are going to fit, right? That could go really badly. And it also turned out when they finally were able to take the trucks out to the site, they had to put the, they had to put the columns on the truck and they weren't allowed to stop. They had to have a police escort because if the truck stopped, it would blow the tires and everything would fall down and, and bad things happen. It would crush into the earth. So they learned all this, of course, the hard way. But it was very successful. They were, only, they were able to do this in a, like a week at night. Very little disruption of the traffic. Pretty amazing technology. Oh, and I like this story. So a company called Briggs Automotive Corporation decided that they were going to make this super awesome car. They're based in Liverpool, England, not exactly by Detroit or Germany or Tokyo. They're not close to any of those powerhouses that we're so familiar with. But a couple of brothers started this company. There's only two dozen, less than two dozen total employees, and they decided that they were going to take on the big guys. So for the large manufacturers, it takes about four years from the original design of a car to actually delivering the car to a dealer to sell it or to, a, or to an individual. To go from individual sketches to clay models like you see here, along with all types of testing, making sure that it's safe and simulation, it takes about four years. So that's a pretty long time. So these guys decided that they were going to do that in two. So they used a lot of simulation, a lot of technology before they ever actually created anything physical. They tested everything substantially by using a lot of Autodesk software and a lot of, a lot of all different types of software in the simulation process to see if they could make things happen faster and, in their view, even better. So the Mono, the Briggs Automotive team, did this in 24 months. It's a supercar. It's track ready, but you can, it's also street legal. It's a highly customized car. They scan the person who's going to be driving the car. You're not sharing the car. They scan the person who's going to be driving the car, and they custom fit the seat and the steering wheel, along with a variety of other things in the car so that it fits just like a glove, and it really just fits just for you. It's very low to the ground. Like I said, they use a lot of Autodesk software to do that. Pretty amazing. There's a little bit more to that. I don't think you're going to take your kids to school in it because, well, there's no place to put them. I don't think you're going to go to the grocery store because there's no place to put those either. But it's a very cool car to drive around. And they're not going to sell thousands of these cars, but they're definitely going to sell hundreds of these cars. And the price tag is a mere quarter of a million dollars. You're all going to get one, right? $250,000. But it was really interesting how they set out to do it. We're able to do it with a very small team in a very short period of time and are very successful with this. So. It's interesting. And we also have over in the design gallery, you can see Autodesk Ember. This is uh, our, our first foray into hardware. It's a 3D printer. It's a very unusual 3D printer. It uses a very specific resin, and it allows you to create very precise like lattice work and things like that that is very difficult for other 3D printers to do. And just to kind of show you, because when we hear 3D printing, we're like, well, what am I going to do with that? Some people really get where 3D printing can help the industry. Let me give you some examples of all different industries where 3D printing is really helping us move forward. So this is, well, first of all, it's a rendering. It's not for real. It's the world's largest 3D printer. And in China, once again, doing all kinds of crazy things in China, they're 3D printing houses. They can print 10 houses a day for 5K each. It's actually um, a very green building. They combine concrete with recycled materials. Here's a picture of what it looks like when it's all said and done. And it doesn't look like such a bad place to live. A lot of people will benefit as a result of this technology. Then we've also seen architectural firms, and I think this is really relevant here. That's why I decided to include this. Architectural firms designing a new high-rise building. Let me show you what it's going to look like in the skyline so that people can visualize that and understand that. So they're 3D, 3D printing the skyline and including their new building in it. So I kind of think of 3D printing as the opposite of the in industrial revolution, right? That's where we learned that we were able to create massive quantities of things and bring the prices down, and more people had access to them, like the car, for example. You can only get a car if you were super, super, super rich until they started mass producing them and the prices came down and then more and more people were able to buy 
the car. So I would say that 3D printing is kind of the opposite of that. It's the rise of personal manufacturing. We're not mass producing, but we're actually able to customize specifically for you, just like that car that I was talking about. We used to just be able to 3D print in ABS plastic, but now we can print in metal and fabric and stone and glass and all different types of materials. So that whole world is just starting to open. I mean, eventually they're talking about being able to buy, do pile printing and start to print things like organs. And that, let me tell you, is not a fantasy. That's going to happen at some point in time. I'm kind of into that. These are the normal earphones, headphones. They are highly personalized. If you happen to go to New York and you walk into their store, they will scan your ear. You go off and have a coffee or a drink, whatever you prefer, and you come back, they're going to give you your new headphones that fit you perfectly. I would appreciate that. I have really tiny ears. It's hard for me to get headphones that fit me perfectly. So who doesn't want headphones that, don't, that fit perfectly, right? We're all shaped a little bit different in our ears. If you can't make it to New York, guess what? There's an app for that. You can put that on your phone. You can take it. You can scan your ear. And then you can take that information and send them to the company, and they will still make your headphones for you. You can pick whatever color you want, and they will mail them to you. That's personal manufacturing. And we didn't really have a chance to talk about you know, UAV drones. I do love the fact that drones can go places where we really shouldn't go, like on a construction site. They can go look at things that would be very dangerous for us to go up and check out to make sure that things are done properly. And we didn't really talk too much about robotics, another day, another time. But I'm going to kind of combine this a little bit. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the 3D printed bridge, which I also love to talk about. This is in the Netherlands using robotic technology, using 3D printing with, uh, with um, metals. Their goal is to be able to put a bridge across one of the canals in the Netherlands. They haven't actually started doing it yet. They're just kind of planning it right now. Here you can see a little video. Just the fact that you can do that with metal is pretty darn amazing. They have to test the design themselves. Then they have to teach the robots to do the design. And then you have to hope, of course, the robots are good at meeting right in the middle, one would hope. There he's testing it to make sure that it's in good shape, it's strong. Autodesk is doing a lot of work with this company, MX3D, to help them assist in this because, hey, let's face it, that's pretty fascinating. Okay, we're going to wrap it up here. Just the last section here, how disruption leads to a better world. So this is the Alaskan Way Viaduct. This is not too far away from Seattle. And people have been complaining about the viaduct, saying that they didn't think it would be very safe in case they, they had an earthquake. They just had an earthquake not too long ago. So a company decided to show us exactly what would happen if they did have another major earthquake. As you can imagine, a very effective video. The mayor does not like this video. I have to remember the mayor of Seattle. I don't like that video. I, in a minute, we get the fire, and then we'll move on. The fire is kind of the best part. There it is. Yay, fire. <laughs> so the point is, bad things will happen. They need to redesign the road. They need to redesign the tunnel. They need to do a lot of work. And this particular roadway carries 110,000 vehicles every day. So a company showed the results if they had a strong earthquake there, and a company also showed the solution. You will see here in a minute a whole new rework for that tunnel. In the interest of time, I think I'm going to move on. I think you get the idea. But pretty effective. And guess what? They're doing that, no surprise, right? We need to build that, so they're building it. And then I love stories like this. This is Kamal. Kamal lost his leg over his knee. He lost it in a motorcycle accident. There are 300 million people every year, a staggering number of people that lose their leg over their knee every year. And it's not like from landmines necessarily, something like that. It's actually from car accidents and motorcycle accidents and bicycle accidents. And it's a very different, difficult prosthetic to fit. And it's a very expensive prosthetic to fit. And as a result, Kamal was walking around with a bamboo stick. His, his family doesn't make a lot of money. They make about $40 a year. A prosthetic for somebody 
who was well off and wanted to get a prosthetic that, that fit all the way up above the knee, it's about $20,000. Kamal's family doesn't have that. The next one down is about $2,000. Kamal's family doesn't have that either. And the next one down from that, the cheapest one was to be like $900. It worked to like a door hinge. It had no range of motion. It was very loud, very noisy. It was not cool. <laughs> People didn't like to use that prosthetic and actually it more than often got tossed away. So this company, DREV, decided that they were gonna come up with a low cost knee. They were gonna design a low cost knee that they could then take out to third world countries or anywhere where poverty was high and where they, there were people that could benefit from it. So this is the result of what they came up with. They came up, came up with an 80 US dollar knee called the Jiper knee. And there's actually a fabulous TED talk about this if this is anything that interests you. They 3D print it, they can customize it, as you can see, it's very simple to work with. It's only five pieces of plastic. You don't need special tools to put it together. It has a full range of movement. You can ride a bike, you can pray, you can do, you can kneel if you want to. There's so many different things that you can do with the Jiper knee. So that's really changed the lives of many people throughout the world. And at Autodesk, we're also very focused on education and helping our students and making sure that our software is available to anyone that needs it when it comes to students, educators, or schools. So all Autodesk software is free to students, to teachers, and to schools. And that's a new program we just broke out a couple of years ago. We're really loving it. It's a pretty amazing program. So if you, kn if you have a student at home that you think might be interested in Autodesk software, if you are a teacher, if you're working with a school, we just want everybody to know that Autodesk is absolutely free to you no matter where you live in the world. In addition to that, Autodesk has a program called the Autodesk Foundation, where we support, we give software away to, to companies that are kind of doing projects for the better good, usually nonprofit companies. But we don't just stop there by giving them the software, we also help them learn to use it, we work with them in any fashion that we can to help them be successful. And specifically, we worked with this company lately called Mass. And Mass is a nonprofit architectural firm, and they do most of their work down in Africa. And there's a city in Africa called Butaro, which has about 350,000 people who live there and no hospital. No way to get an x-ray. You break something, there's nowhere to go to get an x-ray. And many people, specifically babies, die every year as a result of not having this hospital. So they were very focused on building a beautiful hospital for, for Bataro. So once again, we gave them our software, we helped them be successful with the software, and the mass itself, the company themselves, uh, there weren't very many architects in Bataro or even in Rwanda, so they took some of their own architects, they went down there and they trained the ones that looked like they were the most promising and the best that they could to help design the hospital. And then after that, they hired the local people to help build the hospital and they used local materials. So they actually brought some revenue into the town, which was a really important and good thing. And it's not just a matter of paying them, it's also a matter of getting them involved in the hospital so that they support the hospital and that they're really proud of the hospital. And here you can see the result here. The hospital is built. There's also a, a fabulous documentary on this whole hospital talking about all the lives they've been able to save so far just as a result of having the hospital built. But it's a beautiful hospital. It's a happy hospital. It's, if you can imagine such a thing as a happy hospital, the environment is very positive and, and very beautiful for the people that have to hang out there. I mean, hospitals aren't normally known for a place that you want to hang out, but they went to great lengths to make it a comforting place and are just a really nice hospital to go when, unfortunately, you do need to go there. So that's the Autodesk Foundation. So kind of back to what we were talking about disruption. Disruption is not always bad. Disruption often leads to new innovations and new opportunities. And that's what we talked about a little bit today, about disruptions and how we, people and companies and a bunch of stories about people who've taken that, those innovations to the next level. Now at Autodesk, we have all different types of software. We have so many different software products, I, don't, I can't even keep them straight. And I bet you, many of you feel the same way. But that's why we rely on our partners to help you decide what Autodesk products are going to help work for you and help you move forward and help you to, to take a look at the future and the future of making things and move on. So 
hopefully throughout the day, you don't feel too overwhelmed by Autodesk software, but that you know that there's some place that you can go to get the answers that you need to help you be successful. So on that note, once again, as you go through the day, I hope that your mind is open to the future of making things and that you will start to think about things that you can do yourself to move forward in the design industry. And on that note, I am finished. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll see you later today.